Good morning, Restoration Church. Um, you are probably noticing that we are missing a couple people up on the stage today. Um, the Manders are away this weekend. My name is Kate Hawes. You may have recognized me already, but um, my, I, my role at Restoration is I am Director of Kids Ministry, um, but I am very grateful to be able to have the opportunity to uh, lead some music with you this morning. So my friends who are here, sorry, I just said friends like I'm teaching. The people who are here, <laughs> thanks friends. <laughs> um, <laughs> so if you are here, please feel free to join me and you can stand up to sing as we uh, start with some reflective music to bring us into our worship and message today. Savior, I come, quiet my soul, remember, redemption's hill, where your blood was spilled, for my ransom, everything I once held dear. I count it all as loss. Lead me to the cross where your love poured out. Bring me to my knees, Lord, I lay me down. Rid me of myself, I belong to you. and tried human the word became flesh born my sin and death now you're risen everything I once held dear I can like a flood, come 
comes flowing down at the cross at the cross i surrender my life i'm in all of you i'm in all of you where your love ran red and my sin washed white i hold all to you i hold Jesus. There's a place where sin and shame are powerless, where my heart has peace with God and forgiveness. for worshiping with me this morning. You may have a seat. Hey, Ross. Hey, Em. Coming at you on a Friday where I don't get ready. You look great. <laughs> it is what it is. Beautiful. Mm, you showered. You I did win. Shower. You yeah. get to win today. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Hey friends, welcome to Restoration. Yes. Um, if you've been around a little while, ready to let us know who you are, there's a connection card being dropped in the comments. Mm -hmm. encourage you to fill that out. We have a gift for you. We're going to get in the mail to you. If you're in person, then head out to the lobby because you can fill out that same card out there and we'll get um, a gift to you right there and then. Um, but we also give $3 to the Interfaith Food Alliance for every card that we receive. And so just by letting us know who you are, you're making the difference in the life of a family within our community. So, also, you just said Interfaith Food Alliance. Mm -hmm. We are actually right now collecting um, canned fruit and applesauce. And a lot of you went and shared that post today, Friday, because um, we're doing this, you know, for the future. But thank you for sharing that post. And you can drop off in our lobby today if you're in person with us. Or you can also, you could ship things directly to 22 Echo Lane, Levittown. Or people are dropping off at that house under the portico. So mm -hmm. you can big, help, yeah. yes, you yeah. can help us. Um, make a good delivery to the Interfaith Food Alliance. Yeah, cool. Yeah, and of course you can do other things too, but that's like one of the things the shelves are missing right now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So there are three quick things that we want you to be aware of. 
besides that. The first, that's, besides that, the first is drum roll. M. I don't know what you're gonna say. Do you want me to say what it is? Yeah, I was gonna have you say what it is. Oh, sorry. Um, giving statements. Giving statements. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They will be coming out, right? In the uh, next. yeah, like this week, hopefully. Is Heather's goal this week. Yep. So but by the end of the, end of the month, like the very our month. church administrator, yep. and you will have your giving statement by the end of January. But actually, what's really important is you're going to probably have it even this weekend. Mm -hmm. I think it's really soon. I can't remember exactly. She's Heather, on top so of I'm things. Sorry. Yeah, Heather's way on top of things. But she wants you to have them now because she wants you to open them because they're being emailed. If you don't email your giving statement, all of you, thank you for giving, by the way, also. Yes. But yes. Um, if you don't open it, then we have to print it and mail it to you, which is fine. We will do that if we have to, but it would be a great help to us if you would open your giving statement that is emailed to you, mm -hmm. yeah. right? And we're gonna remind you again next week. Mm -hmm. So you have a few weeks to get it open and you, know, open and you can print it off from your own computer in your own home. Right. You might not even need to print it. You might just need the information, the information depending right. on how you do your taxes. Yeah, that's how but, we do it. Okay? Yep. yep, so that was number one. Yes, the second Thanks one, for us out. the second one, and, and Andrew is going to address this at the very end of his message too. But we have a brand new series starting next week. Mm. The series is called Trace. Oh. And it's going to have my daughter and as part of the bumper video, which I have not done yet. But it's which be daughter? Uh, this one right here. Evie. Did you know that Evie? Oh, oh yeah. You She's going to help me out. So you'll see that next week. But What's um, Trace about Ross because I didn't know that was. It's about uh, modeling Jesus. And so the series is really, it's, it's a pretty robust series in a lot of ways. Oh it's, boy, that means you don't have how many weeks you're going to do it for. It could go on for a <laughs> long time. It could go on forever. To Easter. All the way to Easter. Yeah. <laughs> no, but you're going to learn. And so what your next step may be, how to connect, um, how to grow to become like Jesus. So ultimately our hope is that everybody within the context of restoration would learn to become like Jesus. And so and we're going to take your next step, and towards, take your next step that toward, towards that. Okay. Yeah. And so we're going to tell you how that is. We're going to group signups. The door is opening wide for groups, for classes, um, for opportunities Especially to get connected. Especially during the first two weeks of the, service, of the series. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, nice. There's going to be a couple other um, challenges that are going to be put out. It's going to be, uh, I think, uh, I'm, I'm really looking forward to the series. Cool. And I haven't preached in like, preached live in like a it's month. It's been really good so for you. It's so, going to be good for me. Yeah. yeah. So, no, that's, no, it has been good there. for you. Like, it, it has been, been good. good. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so really, we do encourage you to join us starting next week for that series. Okay. Because it's going to be... Yep. Um, a lot of ways to connect and a lot of things to do with restoration. So yeah. Yeah. The last thing that we have for you today. I don't remember. Is Do you remember? Nope, but it's written right over there. <laughs> <laughs> She's gonna take a little breather here. We have it, we have it. How you guys doing today? Oh I remember. I remember. Virtual Virtual welcome party. Welcome party is happening tonight. <laughs> so we actually we have a uh um, that their mind is like gone like in this COVID oh, world like yeah. in this reality we've been living in that like you can't remember like that there were three things we had to remember people and we went over this five minutes ago yeah and mm -hmm. we couldn't remember it yeah our brains are mush yeah. yep okay virtual welcome party tonight at eight o'clock so if you just want to hop on a zoom call with us um to learn about the church to meet some leadership to figure out to, your next to meet step. some new people figure yeah, out next plugging step. in with yeah. us yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um then Email Julie Pegli Setti. Her, her email is Very right, easy. right here. Julie at Restoration Church. Yep, that's right there for her. Yep. Email and say, hey, I would love to, to get that Zoom link for the 8 o'clock tonight welcome party. So that's all I need to do. And we'd love to meet you and greet even, you yeah, okay. and uh, be with you briefly. So. They might even be able to drop that link online, though, because we have like an actual... They can do that, too? Sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So our online host, if you want to drop that to register for the virtual party, that'd be great. If not... Email Julie. Email Julie, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, and we've talked about giving a little bit already. But, yeah. But we are so thankful for everybody who gives. And um, we make it really easy. We try to make it as easy as possible to give. And so there are five very easy ways to do so. You can see them right here on the screen. The fifth one is the, um, the drop box for those of you who are in person. Evelyn is being summoned by her older brother. Um... And so we just want to thank you. You know, we serve a very generous God and we do all that we can to model God, to live like him. And so because he is generous, we strive to be generous, not just with our money, but with our energy, our time, our resources beyond money, our talents. Sometimes we um, can be generous by keeping our mouth shut. Generous with our words? <laughs> or not. Sometimes I just <laughs> get a lot of words floating around. A lot of You've words. You've addressed this. I have. Mm-hmm. But sometimes it's we, more generous to be quiet. We are. Um, I, I have it. Within the next two months, we are going to do a series on words. 
Oh think, yeah. Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna talk about the importance of the words Ooh. that we that we use because it's just. Mm -hmm. It's a, it's an it's an important topic. Generous with our love for one another might be a better way. There you to go. Say Generous it. with our love for Is one another. Yes. Um, and I would say that <laughs> I know a, more people than I ever have personally who have COVID right now. It is not good. So yeah. be safe, please, friends. Um, and when I say not good, I just mean it's very contagious. Like it seems like a lot of people are actually coming down with it, but doing fine, navigating it well. Like yeah. it's kind of like a head cold um, type of thing. But I just want to say to be encouraging to one another and loving one another well mm -hmm. through that, because mm -hmm. yeah. I think there's been, I've talked with quite a few people this week who feel like there's a lot of shame around getting COVID mm. and a lot of blame. Like you weren't being careful and you weren't, mm. and people don't even always know where they get it from. Right. Yeah. And it literally is happening in our universe. <laughs> so just to be generous with our love towards one another and yeah, kind good. and reaching out and yeah. supporting our friends when we know they have COVID or when we know they're struggling. Um, and mental health is almost, I think the mental gain is a lot harder to manage than actually the illness for a lot of people. Not yeah. everyone, but for a lot of people, it's the mental, everything that you have to take care of and all the calls you have to make and all the, just the things that happen once you find out you have it. So we need to really be praying for our community Right? Yep. Yep. Mm -hmm. Let's do that. Okay. Okay. All right. Mm -hmm. Heavenly Father, we um, we want to thank you for all that you're doing at Restoration, uh, the way that you provided us through our people, provided for us through our people. Uh, we're so grateful for everybody who gives in any way, um, whether it be financially or their uh, service, their time, their energy, uh, their generosity through their love, Father, um, to help accomplish your mission and to make you known within our community. I pray that in this year, Father, we would become more like you. Um, and then that uh, that living like you and loving like you would spill out over onto our households and onto our our communities, Father, um, so that even more might come to saving faith in, in you because of the work we're doing here. Uh, for all those people who currently are um, suffering through the, the illness of COVID. Or the mental load of it. Or the mental load of it, all of it, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, we do pray your peace upon them, your shalom mm -hmm. uh, would wash over them and your restoration, your healing, your wholeness, Father, would find its way into our households. Yeah, into, our into our minds, would, yeah, our into our community communities. Yeah, community would love people well through yes. this. Yes, so. we would love people well through it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, and thanks, Andrew, for being there today. We are actually not going to be in the building today. So, or joining We are not with We are you. going to be totally off. It's true. Because we really need it. So, thank you, Andrew, for being there. Absolutely, thank you. And, and to our and other And Kate staff. for leading yep. worship. And, to yeah. everybody else who's helping out today. That's right. Thank you. Yep. Okay. See ya. Stay well. Good morning, everyone. So uh, good to be back with all of you again. And uh, we'll look forward to Ross uh, back next week with the Trace series that I'll highlight uh, at the end. So last week we began this series on grace, talking about God's abundant grace and the fact that we were all dead in our sin, completely helpless, and needing a rescue from him. We also talked about how God intervened in a powerful way. But then here's the next question. What comes next? What comes after that? How do we live in light of the change that has occurred in us by grace? For the sake of time, I won't get into my entire life story. Uh, maybe in the future I'll be, have a chance to share. But I just wanted to illustrate one uh, thing from my past that uh, highlights what we're talking about this morning. So I grew up in a Christian household, became a follower of Jesus at the age of nine, attended a local church, went to youth group, went to Sunday school, was enrolled in a Christian school from third through 12th grade. So as you can imagine, through all of that, I was taught a lot about the Bible. And I knew all about God's grace, and I could tell you all about everything I shared last week. But there was just one problem, that my relationship with Jesus was centered on everything that I knew. It was centered on information, and not about the actual living it out. So what happened then, as I entered my teen years, I became more and more miserable because as I got closer and closer to the mountaintop of knowing everything there is to know, I, f I felt more and more empty. And of course, at that time, uh, pursuing the American dream was a whole lot more fun than pursuing Jesus, or so I thought at the time. And the world was calling my name. And to make a, a long story much, much shorter, 
I was accepted at Laterna University, which is a Christian school in Texas. And I was accepted two weeks before classes started. So I had never taken a campus tour. I had never even seen the place. But my goal at that moment was to run away. I wanted to get away from everyone and everything that I knew and start over uh, again because I was so miserable. So that was my plan. And I was just going to put up with the, the Bible classes to get my degree. But God had other plans, fortunately. And so as I made the long trip south from PA, the moment I pulled onto the campus, it was like God reached down in my car and hugged me. Um, I had a chill go down my spine, got goosebumps. I had never really experienced something like that before. But this whole time I was trying to run the other way, trying to pull a Jonah, if you will. And God in his grace said, I'm not done with you yet. You know, he could have left me to my own devices and said, okay, well, you don't want anything to do with me, then I'm done with you too. But that was exactly the opposite of what happened. And so in that moment, all the bitterness, the anger, the dissatisfaction, the pain, all the things that I was feeling, they all stripped away. And what I was left with was a brand new experience of what it means to actually follow Jesus. And so by the time that orientation weekend had ended, I was a completely different person than when I had arrived there 48 hours earlier. And it's all because of God's grace, which is exactly what we've been talking about. So as we prepare to look at Colossians chapter 3 this morning, you'll see very similar themes to what we talked about last week from Ephesians chapter 2. And there's a good reason for that, because Paul was also the author of the book of Colossians. So this is kind of a, a part two, if you will, a sister chapter to what we looked at uh, last week. So without any further delay, let's, uh, let's take a look at Colossians. So uh, chapter 3, verse 1, he says, Since then you have been raised with Christ. So see, what, last week we talked about the fact that we have been raised and now he's saying, in light of that, here's the next step. Set your hearts in, on things above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. For you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ and God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Now, this is probably a pretty obvious statement that I'm going to make. But the fact that we have been raised with Christ means something. It's significant. And this is not a one-time event. This is an event of grace in our life. It's simply the prelude to a lifetime of living with the grace that we have received. And so being raised with Christ, it gives us a different perspective than, we were, than when we were still dead in our sin. And he's, he tells us here to set our mind on things above. Well, what does that mean? What, what, you know, what does that mean exactly? It means that we can't pursue Jesus and earthly pleasure at the same time. It's like this. If we were to walk around every day staring at the floor, or if you, were, if you got in your car and were driving, doing nothing but staring in the rearview mirror, neither one of those things is going to get you to where you're going safely. And it's the same way when we try to live our life both ways, both pursuing the world and Jesus at the same time. And so whenever we try to change the math to say Jesus plus anything, what we really end up with is less of Jesus. And because we are now alive in Christ, we are dead to our old way of life without him. As it's written here, he says our life is hidden with, with God. And really that just means our relationship with him is secure. Because of grace, God will not fall out of love with us, even when we stumble and fall. That is something that is life-changing. You know, again, because I think human relationships, we're prone to say, well, as long as everything is going well in this relationship, as long as you haven't hurt me, you haven't offended me, we're okay. But the moment that happens, well, now all of a sudden the relationship is strained. That's what happens in an earthly relationship. And sometimes it's easy to project that onto God and to say, oh, no, I've displeased him or I've sinned against him or I've uh, made a mistake in my life. And now, now that relationship is broken. But what we are told here by grace is that it's exactly the opposite. Our relationship with him is secure. And if we've been raised to life by grace, then we can rest secure in knowing that our relationship and the love that he has for us remains the same. And then Paul here, he adds an eternal point of view uh, to this passage when he says that you will also appear with him in glory. What a hope that is, that one day, whether Jesus returns while we're still alive or whether we go to meet him face to face, to know that if we've been raised with Christ, this life is not all there is. And there's eternal life to come. As we continue reading in verse 5, he says this. 
put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived. So last week, we reflected on the fact that all of us were once far apart from Jesus. Being dead in our sin, our thoughts and our actions were the opposite direction of where, uh, where God was. And without grace, we would still remain in God's crosshairs of his wrath. But because we are now alive in Christ, it's time for the sin that traps us to be put to death. And we can just do that by waking up one morning and saying, I'm not going to sin anymore. Is, isn't that how it works? <laughs> no, I, I wish it did, but unfortunately not. Unfortunately, we still wander back to old habits and old pleasures that are not of God. A good example of this we find in the Old Testament in the Bible. God's chosen people, the Israelites, he had just rescued them from the, the land of Egypt where they were slaves. And so he, he brought them, uh, gave them deliverance, brought them out of the land, and now they're on a journey from Egypt back to the land that he had promised them, a land that had everything they could ever want. But along the way, they saw fit to complain, complain that they didn't like the food that they were receiving. Now, mind you, at least they had food to eat. But they didn't like the food. They didn't like that it was hot. They didn't like the journey was so long. And on and on the complaints go. And at one point, they even said, you know what? Egypt wasn't so bad. Let, let's turn around and go back to Egypt, you know, because the food was better there. Never mind the fact that they were slaves. They're now a free people. And yet they wanted to go back to being slaves. And I think our old sin nature is a lot like that. We forget what life used to be like before Jesus. We tend to maybe glorify it or whitewash it and make it seem better than it actually was. We convince ourselves that somehow we can mix the old and the new. The old, the old lifestyle wasn't so bad. We can have both, the best of both worlds, if you will. And I know because I've been there. And rather than putting our sin nature to death, what we do is we let it hang in the closet. And it's like that old familiar shirt that we just can't get rid of. We let it hang in the closet and pull it out from time to time. And so this is the point then that grace enters the equation. Because if God just told us to knock it off and just stop sinning and become more like him, all on our own, all up to our own devices, we'd never get there. We'd never fully uh, come to that place that he desires us to be of our own uh, free will, of our own uh, desires and our own willpower. And I've heard, I once heard it said this that in many cases, God doesn't immediately remove our sins, our mistakes, our failures. Instead, he chooses to mature them out of us over time. And sometimes that can be hard to reflect on, you know, because either we're saying, oh, well, I know this habit or this thing I keep doing. I just want it gone. I need to become more like Jesus in this area, and I'm frustrated because I keep coming back to the same place. Or maybe the other way around, <laughs> that we're kind of dug in to say, well, no, I don't want to give this up. I don't want to surrender this area to Jesus. Whatever the case may be, he meets us where we are, and he uses his grace to mature that thing out of us so that we can become more like him. And when you look at this list of descriptions that Paul uses to describe our old sin nature, what you see is that they're all issues of the heart. They're all corruptions of a good thing. So, for example, going down a pathway of lust and immorality means that we're not viewing sex as a gift from God, but instead has been warped for purely selfish reasons. Pursuing evil desires is a corruption of the good things, the good blessings that God has given to us. And in the same way, <clears throat> excuse me, in the same way, it's impossible to be greedy and content in the blessings of God at the same time. So you see, it's taking a good thing and it's a corruption of it. And it becomes an idol every time we sin, that we bow down and worship it. And unfortunately for us, sin is a lot like salt water. The more we drink it, the more thirsty we become. And so we need more and more and more sin to get the same high out of it over time. And, and here's the problem again. The more we go back to that same well, it's like drinking muddy water. <laughs> you just never can get enough of it. But here's, here's the, the good point, the good news about it, is that the more we discover Jesus, the more we discover his grace, we end up putting more and more of our sin nature to death. 
And the more that we pursue Jesus, the more we find satisfaction and peace and joy. And as I said at the beginning, in my story, it was all about the information and not about actually knowing Jesus personally. And so the information doesn't give you any satisfaction and peace and joy on its own. It's only when we connect what we know about God, what we know about his grace, to actually having a relationship with him. That's where the satisfaction and joy comes from and knowing him. And so when we're commanded here to put our sin nature to death, what it really is is a lifelong process of smashing the idols that get in the way of our relationship with God. We look at verse 8, we see this. But now you must also rid yourselves of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other since you have taken off your old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. Some of you may remember the show, What Not to Wear. I won't take a poll, but some of you may remember that show from a few years ago. And the, the co-host of the show would find someone in need of a wardrobe makeover. And um, if you would see the show, you would see that, yes, some people definitely needed some intervention in that, in that area. <laughs> and they helped them do a total makeover from head to foot. And one of the, the first things they would do in the process is they would meet with the person and go through all their clothing and go through and one by one tell them, these are the things you have to throw away. We're, you're not wearing them anymore. You're getting a whole new wardrobe in place of this. And, and so it's kind of the same thing here that Paul's helping us to understand is he's showing us all the things that we should no longer wear, all the things that were part of our old wardrobe that need to be thrown away. And again, these are all the things that we decide to leave hanging in the closet and pull out from time to time, but they must be done away with. And so the, the power of sin, it went to Jesus, it went with Jesus to the cross. And so through his grace, we have the privilege, instead of receiving God's wrath, we receive this process of renewal, this process of becoming more and more like him. And so can you, can you see, can you understand how profound this is? That instead of wrath, we get a makeover. It, those things are polar opposite, and it's because of God's grace that this can happen in our lives. And, it's, and also, it's not a case of just patching up our worst parts. He doesn't say, here, let me tackle your three worst areas, and I'll just fix those up, and the rest is okay. No, when we, come, when we come to Jesus, it's a complete makeover from head to foot. We are new creations in Christ, not recreations of the old, but brand new creations in Christ. And we look then at this list. Earlier we talked about how the list was centered on heart issues. Well, in this list we see that all of these things center around our words. Emily and Ross highlighted in our video earlier the power of words used for good or bad. And so in the same way here, Paul is saying, these are all ways that we need to watch our words as we live in grace. Anger is a totally normal and natural human emotion but it's often the things that we say and do while we're angry that can get us into trouble. And we see malice and slander and filthy language. Well, these are all things that tear other people down. But instead, if we use our words to encourage them, we are learning how to walk in grace. And likewise, the truth is always stronger than a lie. Jesus told us that when you know the truth, the truth will set you free. But instead, a lie puts us into prison. And so last week I gave a reminder that the Christian life is not built on a checklist. And I want to highlight that yet again. So please don't look at this, this list and say, okay, I'm going to form a checklist and these are all the things that I need to stop doing. <laughs> That's not Paul's intent whatsoever in these verses. And so don't read it that way. Because if it was, this series would be, here, here's the six steps to have a more successful Christian life. That's not how this works. <laughs> and though this is a series about grace for good reason. Because God's grace is not displayed in us just because we're sinless. No, God's grace is displayed in us when we are sinning less. And there will be times when we think that we have a, hangle, uh, a handle on our anger, for example, and then something will set us off. Oh, no. Well, now we're back to the very beginning all over again. <laughs> and on and on it goes. Many examples even though you think you might have it checked off on your list, there's always that reminder of, no, no, deep down I still struggle with getting angry and saying and doing the, the wrong thing. 
So the evidence that we are raised by grace and then live by grace is not in our perfection. Perfection is not the standard. Otherwise, none of us would be able to measure up to that. None of us would ever experience grace if it were based on our performance in that way. But living by grace means that we are completely dependent on God and his grace every day. You know, last week we talked about how but God, but God that he intervenes in our life in the same way. It's by grace. Everything is by grace. And so in, in order to do this, we take off our old sin nature and we start wearing this new wardrobe that we've been provided by grace. In verse 11, he, he goes on to say this. Here there is no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, or free. But Christ is all and is in all. And therefore is God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved. Clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues put on love which binds them all together in perfect unity. We're in a season, I'm, I'm sure you're aware of this, but we're in a season that our nation is more divided than ever, more than I've ever seen in my lifetime. And I think these verses serve as a valuable reminder because our society specializes in getting us to pick a side. There is no middle ground. You're either one side or the other. And I'm speaking in broader terms than politics, by the way. On any given issue, there's this pressure to pick a side. And you wear down your opponent until they fade away, until you win the argument or win the debate or your side of the issue wins. And I think even in the church, sometimes our differences in theology and practice can lead to the same infighting among a church as well. So not even the church is immune to this. And if you see, when, when Paul creates this list, he chooses groups of people that would not normally interact with one another or pursue unity together. For example, he get, begins by saying there's no, no longer a Gentile or Jew. Well, in Paul's day, Jews and Gentiles hated one another. They didn't associate with one another. They most definitely were not seeking to pursue unity together. They were on complete opposite sides of the spectrum. And yet what Paul is saying is that we, when we've been raised by grace, we're all part of the same family. And so it's no longer about picking sides or being on one side or the other, but it's about pursuing unity and peace. And the hard work of grace is to be in the middle. That's the hard work, is to hang out in the middle so that we can listen and engage. Because especially in our political season that we're in, it's so easy to leverage articles and memes, and so we pick our side and then we fight the other one with all the things that we found. And on and on it goes. But that's not helping us pursue grace. It's not helping us pursue unity or love in any way. And so, again, grace is the hard work that has us hang out in the middle so that we can listen and engage. But here's the thing. Being unified does not mean that we agree. And nowhere in Scripture are we commanded to always agree and assimilate to one point of view on every issue. No, instead we are called to demonstrate grace and to put down our sword and to listen and engage wherever possible. And so that's why grace is hard. Grace is hard because it causes us to live in a tension of disagreeing with a person, but still demonstrating God's love to them and still showing them grace. And I'm preaching to myself when I say this, by the way. I need to hear this too. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, not, I'm not just saying it for all of you to, uh, to hear this, but it's, it's also for me as well. And so earlier we read about our old wardrobe that no longer belongs in our closet. And as Paul writes here, he's reminding us of what our new wardrobe, our new clothes look like. We're called to present gentleness and patience instead of rage and anger towards other people. Compassion instead of slander. Kindness instead of malice. And humility to keep us from using filthy language and lying to each other. But then here's the hard one. The hard one is to forgive instead of holding a grudge. Ooh. I, I like the other clothes. The other clothes are okay. But this forgiveness one, we, we just send that back to the store. I'm not, I'm not going to put that one on, right? 
And so we're we going to excel in all these areas all the time. Well, no, of course not, because if we did, we wouldn't need grace. And so God's grace is for us as we often struggle to, to put these things on on a daily basis. And God's grace is a part of the package deal. He's not saying, well, just you figure out how to wear these clothes on your own. No, God's grace is part of the package. And as the more we understand about the depth of grace and forgiveness that we have been given, the more easily we are able to then extend that to other people. And he says here to, to bear with one another. Well, that can be hard. Again, especially when we disagree, especially when we're on two opposite sides of an issue. But even then, we bear with one another, forgive, and show uh, compa compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. It's easy when we agree, but much harder when we, when we don't. And Jesus told us, but before he was sent off uh, to be arrested and then later crucified, he was having a conversation with his disciples, and he tells us that the world will know you belong to me, that you're one of my followers by the love you have for one another. That's our calling card. And so Paul says it here at the end that all these virtues, above all of them, put on love because it binds them all together. And radical love for one another begins with the radical love that God has given to us. And it's only by receiving and understanding the love that God has for us that we are then able to love each other in radical ways. And so we know this love when we've been raised by grace, and we extend that love to others as we live by grace. And so as we wrap up this series and our time together, I hope that you have gotten more than just some information, some, some information about what grace is. My hope is that God brought his grace to you wherever you are, uh, in your location, if you're online or here with us, but also brought his grace to you wherever you're at in a season of life. And so if you've never experienced what it means to be raised uh, to life by grace, my prayer is that God's grace found you right where you are so you had an opportunity to meet him for the first time. If you entered this series feeling distant from God, kind of what my story was, that I knew him, but I was distant from him, my prayer is that God reminded you of his grace and that he brought you back to himself, uh, just like he did for me. Maybe you entered this series feeling hurt and broken because of what someone else has done against you or, or even own your own choices that you've made. My prayer is that this series was a reminder that God's grace helps, he knows and understands where you are and that he, he forgives and restores. And maybe you entered this series trying really, really, really hard to follow Jesus and to fill out your checklist every day. My prayer is that this series reminded you that it's not about the checklist. It's not about the do's and don'ts. And to trust the process of grace that God is working in your life. And maybe even as we began this series, you found yourself caught up in conflict with someone you know or just caught up in the conflict going on in our nation. My prayer is that you have seen that God's grace is a pathway to peace, to lay down our sword and to listen and engage. And maybe you entered this series in none of those groups, and that's okay too. The point is that all of us need God's grace. All of us needed to be rescued by Jesus and raised to life. None of us are perfect, and all of us still need his grace as we smash our idols, throw away our sinful old clothes, and learn how to dress up in this amazing gift of God called grace. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your great and abundant grace that you give to us. Not because we earned it, not because we can measure up to some sort of standard on our own, but Lord, you, you gave us grace to show us your love, to show us your mercy, to make us more like you, to raise us to life. And then, Lord, as you show us how to live like you, to live by your grace as well. So, Lord, help us to not just depend on our own strength, our own willpower, but, Lord, on a daily basis to surrender our lives to you, to surrender to the power of your grace, knowing that without it, we have nothing, that we depend on you, not just uh, to get through a day, but Lord, we depend on you to, to grow, to become more like you. And so, Father, equip us with your grace. 
equip us with the ability to put on these new clothes that you have given to us. So, Lord, as, as we walk around in this new wardrobe, people can see and know and experience who you are through us, through, through the love that we exhibit, through the grace and, and forgiveness and mercy that we extend to others. Lord, may people know you by our actions and also by the words that we share as we give testimony to this great and abundant grace that you have given to us. It's your name that we pray this. Amen. So before everyone's dismissed today, I just wanted to give a little teaser, if you will, uh, for what's coming next with our Trace series. And so when Jesus washed his disciples' feet, he said, I've done this for you now. Now I want you to go and trace my example. Learn to copy me, learn to be like me, learn to mimic my behavior. So if we have the little blessings uh, preschool here in the building, and if you were to go back there, you would see kids tracing their letters and numbers and they're sloppy. I, I think we probably have seen kids <laughs> doing that. So in the beginning, tracing is hard and messy, and over time, as we practice and grow, tracing gets easier and tidier. And it's the same with following Jesus. 
Becoming like him is something that we grow to do, develop, and learn. So this series called Trace, it's all about how we desire everyone to grow and improve upon their tracing through groups and learning communities, a series about how you become, can become more like Jesus at restoration. And so, uh, again, come back next week as Ross begins that series, and uh, we're looking forward to seeing all of you then. And uh, so now you'll be dismissed uh, by Roe. Thank you.